Hi everybody. Go-arounds are our last chance to get out of trouble after things have gone wrong. But we do these go-arounds when we're nearly out of energy and close to the ground. So our last pathway to escape trouble is also a pathway that's very unforgiving of errors. Let's take a look at some samples of crashes during go-arounds. Then we'll take my planes out and experiment with some of the issues behind these crashes. Maybe we can learn something useful. We'll definitely burn some gas and make some noise. I'm John. I have planes. Let's fly these crashes. The vast majority of crashes during go-rounds occur for two different reasons. Loss of control and failure to get the airplane to perform as anticipated. There's also a smattering of other causes like fuel mismanagement in there as well. The most fatalities by far results from loss of control. Struggling for control on a go-around makes sense for a lot of reasons. First, many times we're initiating a go-around, we're already several steps into some kind of mishap chain. So outside of training, we might not be doing these when we're at our best. Second, the go-around places the pilot into what may be an unfamiliar situation. The airplane's controls feel and behave differently at low speed, high power, and in the landing configuration. This unfamiliar behavior, combined with a high task load, especially if the pilot is caught off guard, is a recipe for disaster. So if we want to maintain control during a go-around, we need to make ourselves familiar with go-arounds and the facets of flight during a go-around. And that means first getting and keeping ourselves familiar with how the plane behaves in high power, high drag, and low speed situations. Let's start with control exercises. These are about building up our awareness of control demands. When we do these exercises, we can't use habitual control inputs, and we aren't simply reversing our aileron and rudder mix either. We're making ourselves use controls as needed, and that requires us to pick up on information as needed. So this is a simple drill to expand our perceptions. So what we're going to do is we're going to hold a heading at an altitude, and then we're going to slowly bank the airplane left and right. While we're banking the airplane left and right, we're going to use rudder as necessary to hold our initial heading. We'll be holding a constant altitude and nearly a constant pitch. We can start with medium banks like these, and I'll do these going to and from my working area, which is why we're not pegged on a cardinal heading right now. You might find these a lot easier if you line the plane up with the section lines in your area. Here's an external view of the plane, and you can see the controls only move a little bit, and you can also see that the rudder isn't synced to any particular phase of the maneuver or any particular setting of the aileron. It's use the controls to get the desired result, or use the controls as you need to. See how I let my heading drift a few degrees at the end there? I also lost about 40 feet. I won't get all persnickety about less than 5 degrees and less than 50 feet, but I will get on myself for thinking the maneuver is over when the maneuver is still on. So let's redo it. There we are. You can play with these. A final note is this low repeating left to right movement does make people queasy, so don't do this with passengers. It makes for a bad ride. Now we're going to explore how the airplane behaves at full power in the takeoff configuration, and then we'll do it again at full power in the landing configuration with full flaps. This is about familiarity with control demands in critical scenarios. We also get used to finding secondary attitude information when our view of the horizon is lost at high pitch attitudes. In years gone by, we used to get this through slow flight, and back then slow flight would include keeping the plane at the absolute minimum controllable airspeed we could achieve. We'd be hanging out with our stall warning horns screaming, pre-stall buffet rattling our tails, and we'd see if we could nurse the airplane around the sky with the airspeed needle off the bottom end of the indicator. Turns out we could, for as long as cylinder head and oil temperatures would allow us. But this was negative training. We were inadvertently training ourselves to ignore stall warning indications. So the FAA modified the ACS for slow flight. In that spirit, we have to find a way to build up this skill in aircraft control in a way that does not teach us to habitually ignore stall warnings. So 
we're going to do full power stalls straight ahead. You'll notice that your ailerons become progressively less effective in roll, but just as effective in adverse yaw. As we go deeper into the stall, the ailerons become ineffective entirely and may even reverse function. These certified airplanes are required to demonstrate normal roll response in a power on stall only to about 75% power. So a finer pitch prop, a higher horsepower engine, just being at full power, etc., all means that you're going to get more roly poly than what the test pilots experienced. Here's a full power stall in the Cessna 170. Whether we're in the Cub or the 170, because of the propeller slipstream, we don't get a nose drop like we might usually expect. The wing tips stall before the roots, leading to wing drop, and that needs to be corrected with rudder. Aileron corrections, which might be instinctive, will actually work against us here. So we don't want to explore these quirks when we're close to the ground below the treetops. We want to regularly take ourselves into these combinations of power, speed, and configuration so we get ourselves familiar and keep ourselves familiar and comfy with the plane's handling. Finally, we'll practice go-arounds from a low energy state. Select a long, wide, and quiet runway, and then identify some terrain feature by the runway, like a hangar or a tree or a windsock, and you're going to use that as your last chance to go around marker. This will get us in the habit of thinking about if the airplane will be in a spot where a go-around can't be done, and where that final chance to go around actually is along the runway. Fly an approach into the flare at a normal speed and use power to hold the plane off the runway at your normal touchdown speed. Use normal inputs to keep the airplane on center line, aligned with the runway, and within a couple feet of the ground. If you accidentally touch down, hey, no big deal. Just goose in some power and get the plane back into the air. Sometime before you hit your last chance marker, execute a go around. When that gets old, you'll do the same thing, but this time you'll be using power to hold the airplane off as near as possible to stall speed. And this will be similar to your soft field technique. Just like before, you'll hold the airplane off a couple feet from the runway, and if you accidentally touch, no big deal. Goose in some power, get back into the air. And just like before, you'll execute a go around before you hit your last chance marker. Pay attention to how much longer it takes to get the airplane up and climbing from these lower speeds. You'll also want to take note of how much workload it takes to keep the airplane at these low speeds over the runway. Controllability, gust tolerance, and you want to learn this at a benign airport before you go someplace austere. So what about when we just can't get planes to climb? Sometimes that can occur if we forget to do something during the go-around, like forgetting flaps or leaving the carburetor heat on. How much do these errors really cost us? Well, let's take a moment to review what the planes were required to demonstrate for certification. As airplane certification has changed over the years, so have bulk landing climb requirements. Airplanes certified after World War II under Civil Air Regulations Part 3 or Part 4 were certified to make about 30 to 1 climb gradients during a bulk landing. That translated to a pretty flat climb gradient of around 200 feet per nautical mile. And this was based on achieving takeoff power and if the flaps could be retracted quickly, flaps up. A reconfiguration of the airplane would be needed in order to clear the trees. Later on, in the 1960s, small airplanes were certified under Federal Air Regulation Part 23. Those planes were required to make a similar climb gradient, but the conditions were made a little bit more realistic. The planes still needed to make takeoff power, but the flaps had to be in whatever setting they could achieve in two seconds or less. A reconfiguration, however, still was needed to clear the trees. And this covers the vast majority of airplanes that we're likely to encounter. But a recent rewrite of FAR Part 23 has made changes to bulk landing climb gradients. Brand new airplanes now need to make takeoff power, but climb gradient of only 180 feet per nautical mile needs to be achieved, and that's with landing flaps. So brand new airplanes, certified under the latest rewrite of Part 23, do not need a reconfiguration down low in order to clear the trees. So how much performance do we really lose if we do forget to retract the flaps, or if we don't make takeoff power when we forget to close the carburetor heat? To figure out how much these errors will cost us, I took my Cessna 170 out and I compared go-arounds done normally with flaps left at 40, and again with the carburetor heat left on. To provide for nearly equivalent go-around conditions, each time I landed the plane, I'd roll out to a set speed before advancing power for the go-around. So here are the different conditions presented side by side. 
These are frozen at the instant power is applied during the test, and each test is started at slightly different positions along the runway. But we use our cameras and other data to figure out exactly how far we travel from power application to clearing the treetops. A normal go-around is presented on the left. In the middle, we have a flat 40 go-around. And on the right, we have a go-around with the carburetor heat left on. We'll freeze each video when the plane makes it to the treetops and get an estimate of some distances. Let's see how they compare. The normal go-around is above the trees, about 1,600 feet down the runway after power is applied. A little later, the plane with the carburetor heat on makes it over the trees, and the plane with 40 degrees of flaps hanging out there finally makes it to the treetops about 2,300 feet down the line. Let's see how the planes climb after the treetops are cleared. First, let's compare a normal go-around to the plane with the carburetor heat left on. You can see the normal go-around is climbing away quite nicely, and the plane with the carburetor heat on is still climbing, albeit at a reduced rate. You can clearly see both planes climbing relative to the ground features. Now let's look at the plane with the flap stuck at 40. As it climbs away, it actually stops climbing. It's stuck at the treetops. Looking side by side, here's the start and tree clearing position of the normal go-around. Here's the start and tree clearing position of the go around with flaps 40. And here's the start and tree clearing position of the go around with the carburetor heat left on. Compared side to side, you can see that having landing flaps out there makes a big difference, but the performance penalty of leaving the carburetor heat on is also pretty big itself. These were done at only about 80% of our limit weight and on a cool day. A higher airport, a heavier airplane, or a hotter day would see these penalties increase disproportionately to the change in condition. So a little bit higher, a little bit hotter, a little bit heavier would make these mistakes much more costly. At various airlines, we have similar considerations. The plane needs to be reconfigured to clear the ridge lines. So we train callouts, flows, and procedures. We get to a point where certain things have an almost Pavlovian response. Go around. Flap 20, set thrust, positive rate, gear up. Or something similar gets repeated over and over and over so that when we do go around, we remember to get the flaps moving. We will, in fact, verify we're climbing away from the ground. We will remember to retract the landing gear. 40. Go around. 30. Flap 15, 20. set, go around thrust. Go around thrust, set. Gear up. Positive rate. And I'd say we should be training ourselves and our students to have some kind of mantra or flow for a bulk landing. But here's an important thing. None of this, even in a critical situation, needs to happen fast. It just needs to get done right. Let's return to this video of a Cessna 180 doing a go around. The pilot adds power and takes a second or so to get the flaps moving. Then he has enough spare brain power to know to follow a turning escape route rather than trying to outclimb the pine trees at the end of the runway. Well done. A lot of loss of control accidents are rooted in a rush to get the airplane away from the ground before it's configured to successfully climb. Here are some videos of loss of control events involving full flap go-arounds. In fact, a lot of go-around losses of control occur with airplanes that are also misconfigured. A disciplined routine to follow, along with some forethought about escape triggers and escape options, can do a lot to keep a pilot on the right track. Whether you're flying a Cessna, a Cub, or a 767, a go-around is probably the most likely thing that you'll have to execute as a surprise. Maybe there's a school bus on the runway. Who would have thought that? If you're like me, you probably practice a lot of power-off spot landings. They're fun. Practicing a go-around isn't as fun. Also, no matter how hard we try, we equate landing, even crappy landings, with success. Go-arounds, even excellent go-arounds, aren't the things we think about when we're rubbing our bellies after eating a giant flounder with whiskey. 
But we really need to be practicing go-arounds just as much as anything. An early decision to go around can make the difference between life and death at some airports. Seemingly endless repetition of go-arounds from different energy states and configurations makes the difference between maintaining control or losing control when the chips are actually down. And practicing go-arounds makes it easier to decide to go around. And getting good at go-arounds actually allows you to get just a little bit weirder, just a little bit longer, if you're building up your skills for a particular set of tasking. Anyway, if you like videos like these, please check out these other videos on my channel, or even subscribe. If you have thoughts you want to share about this video or others, I love hearing from you guys in the comments. Thank you for your time.